Anthrax was a product of love of Marshall, my wife, and me. We really loved the band. We really loved the guys. And we really shared some wonderful times with them. Johnny stopped. Uh, it was after the Santa White Noise cycle. And um, at that point, they uh, you know, started talking to different managers. I was no longer in that guru position. There were tour managers that tried to take over the spot and all kinds of things that were happening that really bothered me. So when the time came for a departure, I felt that it was a good time for both the band and myself. I think Johnny was just, you know, ready to retire, ready to get out of it at that point. 11 years went pretty fast. You know, he's just, he was in it so long. And he, what else could he prove? I mean, what Johnny's done with, with not only Anthrax, but you know, thrash metal, the whole metal world, it would be so different if there was no Johnny Z. And what else could he prove? I mean, he created this genre, you know, or this platform for this genre to be heard. Um, he did it on his dime. It was, it was fantastic. You know, that's all I could tell you. It was a fantastic 11 years and uh, no complaints. We basically stayed friends for a long time until I ended up managing, uh, starting Concrete Management and Grim Reaper and then eventually Pantera White Zombie. And we were always, you know, they toured together. We opened for them, they opened for us. And through the years, every once in a while, they'd ask me if I'd be their manager. And uh, at the times I always said no. Walter managed Pantera. He pretty much was managing the biggest metal band in the world at the time. We thought, what better place to be than with that guy? Volume eight, the threat is real on the Ignition Records. They asked me to do it and I said, you know what? Yeah, that would be fun, let's do it. He's definitely got a lot of doors open to him, you know, in the metal world. So it would be a great place for us to be too. We had been friends with Walter forever. So that worked out that we had Walter managing us. We were gonna, you know, find a new label and, and fresh start for Anthrax, you know? 90s are almost over, here comes the 2000s. You know, before I even met them, you know, I knew what like the label issues they were going through because I was such a big fan that I would read, you know, read up on what was going on. We had such a great run with uh, the White Noise record on Elektra, sold a lot of records for Elektra, and all of a sudden, the label that signed us to do that record was now gone. And the people that brought us there were no longer there. So there was a whole new regime that came in and they wanted to make that label more urban dance. So we were gone. We had set up a studio at our place in Yonkers. So we had gotten a bunch of those ADAT machines and um, you know, we had started to make demos on them and we thought the demo sounded pretty good. So we made the decision, what if we actually kind of worked on the room a little bit here? Let's try actually recording it here in our room. The thing about Anthrax, and I always say this, and this is, I say this from the bottom of my heart, is that whether I was part of it or not part of it, Anthrax is a band that always was willing to take a chance. You know, bring the noise and I'm the man, or playing covers, or the, wearing what they were wearing on stage during a state of euphoria, or having, you know, Angelo Balladamente come in and like do a song. It, it just, there were so many things that they did that they were saying, let's do this. You're proving something. You're proving something to yourself, but it's also to others who always said, you can't do that. And it's like, well, fuck you. We're gonna do it. And you know what? At one point, we just said, fuck all this shit. And we just started doing things our own way, not worrying about this guy at this label or this guy at this radio station. And it was just like, fuck it, let's just move forward. Again, whether I was in the group or not, they didn't, Told the public, hey, what would you guys think if we did this? They didn't give a shit. They just said, we're doing this. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Just do it because you love it and you want to. And we don't even care what the ramifications are. Uh, we're just doing it. And I think that that is what separates them from the majority of metal bands. I was just happy to be there. You know, it, to me, we it was awesome that we were, that here I was in this band Anthrax and um, who was this big band playing these killer gigs. And it was like, this is, you know, it was amazing. In the 90s, he fit. Like, 
their music changed a little on Sound of White Noise and the other uh, Stomp and Volume 8. Um, I, but I loved it. I loved where Anthrax went. We're searching for a label and they got on this label called Ignition Records. You want to go where, where they're going to promote your, your record. You, you, you move to record labels if you are going to move a record label because you want to be promoted and, and, and handle the album the right way. Uh, and the music that you just busted your ass on for how many months and, and you, you give your give your life to it pretty much and give it life. And so when you when you go to a record company, you, you know, what you're expecting when you, you sign a contract that it's going to be promoted the right way that's set in the contract. Something, a lot of the times that doesn't happen. A lot of the times. And that's just part of this business, man. The title of Volume 8, it was our eighth album. <laughs> and uh, it's a play on the Sabbath thing, Volume 4. We just, oh, they did Volume 4 for their fourth record. We'll do Volume 8 for our eighth record. Like, we thought we were very clever. <laughs> volume 8, you know, did it, it barely came out, and it was such a shame because the music was so good. It was a very independent label, and nothing really much got done. So it was a slow period for them. Volume 8, a lot of it was, re my, the vocals were recorded at the studio in Yonkers, actually. We set up a studio at the rehearsal place in Yonkers. Let's try actually recording it here in our room where we just, you know, things feel great for us in this room. There's a lot of energy in this room and uh, why not try it? It was our studio in Yonkers and, you know, I had a love-hate relationship with it. And, Recording John Bush in the studio was a highlight for me. You know, he always came prepared and he always delivered. Paul was already heavily ensconced in, in in the anthrax world, had been for years. Yeah, he knew how to work all that stuff. <laughs> None of us did. He knew how to record. Tracking guitars was really cool. I think Charlie used every guitar he owned on that record. I'm talking like two dozen. <laughs> Dime has his own sound. He just comes out with stuff that's just so moving, and uh, just the way he expresses it, uh, he's just awesome. And uh, his playing on this record is fucking killer. He's on a couple of tracks. I mean, you can hear it. I said, what do you want to do it? And he said, well, the last one, you got me a TV. Uh, this one, and he gave me the model number and everything for this camera, this video camera, which was probably with three was shot on uh so he's like i could use this video camera so i said okay we'll get it for you and we got him a, a video camera and uh i guess they shot a lot of the next video the, the home video all on that camera so yay thank you we were pretty much done with all the music when the call came to support pantera we did like uh I want to say four or five months with those guys off and on. We did a tour with Pantera, like back-to-back -back tours. It just took a toll on my voice. Um, eating Taco Bell every night and drinking so much whiskey. I, I sang like shit, quite frankly. But I had a lot of fun. And we had some great shows, amazing shows. Every day was a fun day. Every day was, was like a circus, you know? It was a great circus. I mean, at any given moment, your door could swing open and a tray of shots will be brought in, or you'd be in your bunk with a hundred and something fever, and your curtain would open up and it'd be Daryl, you know, it's like, I heard you sick, what's going on, you know? And it's like, ah, oh, dude, I'm sick, I'm, I got a fever, and he's like, he gives me a shot, and he's like, boozes the healer. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way I'm drinking that, you know? I puke up everything. So anyway, I ended up doing the shot, I ended up doing the show, and, felt great after it. It was like, wow, what a miracle. And then about 20, 30 minutes later, I was back in bed, like, fucking shivering. <laughs> we got Phil Anselmo singing on Killing Box. I managed to fit uh, some recording gear in the bay with hopes that Phil would do some guest vocal. And he did. Uh, I set the, uh, the rig up in his dressing room one day. And... <laughs> Pretty impressive. <laughs> Uh, what you're hearing on the record is pretty much one take. Anthrax music, very fun to play in guitar. Love playing in this. Still do, actually. I like Paul Crook. He was a great guy live and on record. Just because you record on the band's record, it doesn't mean you're going to share their stage. You know, so I was really excited when I got that phone call. 
Uh, it was awesome. You know, we had some, we had a lot of fun on the road. We had some great tours. We did all these tours, you know, Japan and Europe many times, and then we went to Australia, and um, so, you know, and all over the States. And we had amazing tours, and, and I had great shows, and we had so many fun times. It was always easy because it was, you know, it was an Anthrax, and Anthrax was just a much bigger band than Armored Saint, even at its lowest level. The problem was uh, Danny's style is so different from me. He's uh, very diatonic, a lot of notes, very fast and linear, um, more pentatonic and more bend and shape, you know, for the most part. You know, yeah, I find Danny Souls to be very difficult to play. Paul had been around and kind of in our camp for so long at that point, you know, because he, he was a guitar tech years before that, and we had known Paul for so long, and we were all such good friends. It just it was like osmosis, you know, it just made sense. He just kind of fit right into that role. I loved sharing the stage with him. I learned so much. Yeah. Frankie Bello, he's like, he's like Paul Stanley, you know, never stops moving and he just leaves it all on the stage. Well, they all do. I am so, so fucking honored and humbled and still overjoyed uh, with the thought of being associated with them. I really love those guys. But then I came back and I was like, my voice is just, is trashed. And then we're like, we gotta get to work and, re and continue recording. And I remember like, I couldn't, I was just struggling. And I had to go see a doctor, this guy, Dr. Kessler, who's in New York, who works with Madonna and some, you know, Broadway actors, you name it, he's, he's dealt with everybody. And he was like, dude, you, you've got like two infections in your throat, not just one, two. He said, you can't, you gotta rest for like eight days. You can't sing, you can't even talk. Then my voice came back and it was like powerful. And, and then Paul's like, oh, you're back. And then and, and we did mo the majority of vocals after that. And it was, it sounded great. Things seemed to be going well. The video for Inside Out that we did was, I think the best video we've ever made. Honey, do you want me to sit by the window? Do you want to move? No, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll be fine. And it doesn't matter where I sit, does it? It's not about the seat. It's about the airplane. The video for Inside Out was one of the most fun video shoots I'd ever been on. I've been on a few dozen. They made a spoof of the old William Shatner Twilight Zone. Marco Siega directed that. He had done Fueled and Nothing With Us from the Stomp record, and we loved working with him. And uh, man, he just pulled that video off. You know, we got to be in a fake airplane, like where they shoot TV shows. And, and so they have the interior fuselage of an airplane, but instead of the gremlin out on the wing in the rainstorm, it was the band. And Bush and everybody else would come up to the window and stare in it. And it was, it was a lot of fun and it was a great video. Somebody said to me early in my career, um, you know, you, you make a, a music video for a band, those images will be forever tied to that track. A band can put their heart and soul into something and then your shitty music video can be married to it for the rest of eternity. And uh, that felt like a big responsibility. The one thing that you can control as an artist is the quality of what you do. You don't know what's gonna happen as far as success goes financially. And you just don't know. It's a giant roll of the dice. I worked with another guy, Tim Gaber, who did um, volume eight and Tim's concept was very Mars Attacks, kind of old school type of art, horror movie, sci-fi. And I was like, awesome, I love it, let's do it. And I called up Mark Weiss to do the back shots and he did it and that was put together like, like that. There's some great songs on that record. It, you know, it's the one record that kind of gets kind of hidden, put behind the eight ball, if you will, but like Catharsis, Inside Out, Crush. I mean, those are like awesome tunes. Crush and Inside Out, I think, are two of the best songs we've ever written. Another one, underrated. Uh, I think there's some great songs in that. Another great journey. Uh, I just felt like it was under the radar, man. I look back at the, the time of Volume 8, and I have a lot of good memories from it. Uh, recording the record, um, touring the record. You know, it was, it was a good time, although it was not such a good time you know it was the best of times it was the worst of times at the time too uh, heavy metal was starting to fade rap was starting to come in mtv sort of woke up one day and decided they weren't in the rock and roll business anymore 
the beginning of the decline happened right around Stomp and, you know, kind of went a little further, went, continued to go south as far as the popularity and success financially and, and all that. And the record came out summer of 98 and we were getting a little bit of radio and uh, we were playing these radio festivals. Um, it was the early days of radio stations, like doing big rock shows. Like, so I remember we went out and played a big show in, in Chicago. Um, Rammstein, I think it was maybe their first time in America. They were on that show. And uh, we were, suddenly we were like playing the big crowds, you know, after kind of the demise on Stomp, things were really looking up. It was like the week our record came out, Tommy Boy pulled everything from Ignition and Ignition had nothing. So our record did not get promoted. Nobody knew it was out and we knew it was out. And here we were going, yeah, this record's great. And everybody's like, what record? And then I got a call. This It's like such like the behind the music thing. Like, and then the record came out and the label folded. So I think that's where the story is. Like, it's a great record, but no, not many people know it because the label folded <laughs> when the record came out. Ignition's gone out of business. They they closed their doors. They're, it's over. They're done. The record's done. What do, you, what do you mean the record's done? And he said, it's done. There's, there's no label. They they. They can't, there's no one making CDs. Like there's no, that whatever product is still out there in the stores, that's it. And then there won't be any more. So people won't even be able to buy it. We weren't gonna let these things kind of bother us, even though I think personally, myself, it bothered me a lot. Um, after all the hard work and, and uh, all, all the good feelings and the energy and everything we had put, into that record to have that happen, it was really disconcerting. You know, they, they had a harder time, obviously, with it than I did, because I was just like, well, this, you know, these are still gonna be great shows, it's gonna be awesome. We just kept moving. We just kept moving forward. And we did uh, tons of shows. We did tons of shows with Pantera, and those were very uplifting. The volume eight was well received when it came out. It was very well received. It just went away. Unlike some of the other bands I like, like Rush and, and Metallica, Anthrax doesn't have a clunker for me. They really don't. In the dis in the discography, there's not one Anthrax record that I that I look at and go, meh, skip. There isn't. I listen to all of it. If it wasn't for the Volume Eight record, I don't know if there would have been a, uh, you know, are we come for you all or worship music. Um, I'm glad we did this record. There's some songs in this record that I'm really, really proud of, especially Inside Out, especially Catharsis, um, especially a song called Stealing From a Thief. Um, so there was there was great moments on it. Uh, it's just that no one really had, had heard it. There's a hidden track on that record, Volume 8, from my brother Anthony. A side track that I wrote for my brother when my brother passed, so that means a lot to me. So My brother was murdered and uh, I was going through a lot of stuff and as Charlie was because he was his nephew. So I, I wrote this song and the guys were, were kind enough to let me put it on uh, as a hidden track. A little Easter egg right there. But it was, it was a tough time. You know, we all knew Anthony since he was a little kid. I think it was really important for that to be on a record and to, to put that out there and for Frankie to be able to kind of spill his guts in, in, in that way. My, my words won't give it the weight, really, that uh, it, it, it deserves. That whole time with Volume 8, it made us very aware of how things can change and how things can be taken away from you very easily. And I think it brought us back to where we were in 1983, 1984, you know, that hunger we started to turn it around. We went through a period of weirdness and then we regrouped. 